welcome everyone to our 20th annual Social Enterprise Conference Digital Series. Um, this is a, a real treat to be in this beautiful space in Cooperman Commons. And thank you for everyone who's joining us online today. A few quick announcements. We are going to be taking questions from the audience. If you're here in person, we'll have handheld mics. So just wait for a mic to come to you so that everyone um, who's online can also hear you. And for those of you that are online, please feel free to use the Q&A in Zoom webinars and there'll be student leaders in the uh, room itself who will speak out your questions out loud, all right? So that's how we're gonna um, have some engagement. For our MBA students, um, those of you who haven't done your Phillips Pathway for Leadership, this is an approved PPIL event. Um, there is a QR code at the entrance and remember go to campus groups for your reflection. And if you've got any questions about that, just email us at socialenterprise at Columbia, um, gsb.columbia. Those of you that are new and haven't come to this series before, uh, this Capital for Good series looks at the spectrum of capital and showcases social impact leaders who are doing really terrific things to try and solve and tackle social and environmental problems. And this campus forum really serves as a way to figure out what is going on in the field? What are some terrific leading examples of um, things that are happening in this space? And so if we can maybe flick to the next slide, the Capital for Good spectrum, this is the spectrum as we think about it at Columbia Business School. We are somewhat agnostic as to where our students and alumni, for example, decide to focus, but we think that we need much more of all of it from ESG and socially responsible investing through to philanthropy. If you um, think about a metaphor of building a, a house, for example, you have a, a toolkit and lots of different tools that are appropriate at different points of that construction process. And you know, there's not one tool that can fix every single thing that you're trying to build or fix every single problem during that process. We think we need much more of all of it. So if you're curious, this slide is actually posted on our website, if you don't need to take a photo of it, but um, our Capital for Good series highlights leaders that are crossing lots of these different areas. And that's why today we're so thrilled to welcome our, um, our keynote speakers. We have with us today Asahi Pompey, who's a 97 Columbia Law School graduate. We're thrilled that you're back here on our new campus. Um, she's the Global Head of Corporate Engagement at Goldman Sachs, and she'll be discussing how Goldman Sachs thinks about deploying capital to solve social and environmental um, challenges and sparking economic growth for people and communities around the world. With, the, with her joining us is Professor Dan Wang, who was only recently announced in January as the new co-director for the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise. We're so thrilled to have both of them, to welcome them um, into the space today. Thank you, Dan, if you'd like to come up. Thank you everyone for being here. I am so delighted to be able to welcome Asahi to our wonderful new campus. And I think this is one of the most important themes that we can be talking about in this space as well that represents transparency and collaboration. From my end, uh, uh, as the new uh, faculty co-director of the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise, it's a distinct honor to be having a space to talk about these topics. Um, before we begin, normally what I would do is introduce our speaker, but part of this fireside chat is to let Asahi tell us a little oh, bit why? about her background. And so I'll be foregoing that, but I just wanted to mention something that I hope almost all of you who are MBA students here remember from your strategy classes, in particular, the class session on Eli Lilly, where we talk about environmental and social impact of the strategies and the strategic choices that firms um, make. And part of that session involves us as strategy instructors showing you a slide that shows the results of a survey that we had done about five years ago and have updated since about what students' primary motivating factors are when it comes to selecting a career, a job, and an employer to work for, which is top of mind for all of our MBA students. Salary, of course, is near the top, but for the first time ever, five years ago, and then ever since then, tied or above that is impact, in particular, social impact. And this is cross-industry as well. 
And so with that as a background, I could not think of a better person to talk about these various themes, the S in ESG, than Asahi Pompey. So please join me in welcoming her. So I would love to begin by talking about your career path. Uh, in particular, that takes your way, that takes its way through Columbia Law School. We have a diverse crowd joining with us today. Um, and as you know, many companies today are looking to diversify their talent, particularly at the senior levels. Can you share with us your journey into the finance sector and what it was like rising to the level of success that you've achieved in your career? Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you to all of you for joining. I know a number of you are joining remotely, and I want to say hello as well. And I want to thank Sandra and Dan for having me. It's exciting to be back and it's exciting to be here on this beautiful campus. And so thank you for having me. Um, you know, I, I would start by saying my career started with a whole bunch of failures. Um, and so I remember the first job I applied for was uh, I wanted to work at McDonald's. Um, and for those of you who know Brooklyn on Utica Avenue, there's a McDonald's near Lenox Avenue. Um, and I had my mom photocopy all of the information. I was 14 at the time. Um, my report card, my, I'd written an article on South Africa for the school newspaper that was on the front page. Um, and I went from McDonald's to McDonald's with this packet to try to get a job. Um, and I remember talking with one of the managers and he kind of flipped through the materials. And then he said, have you ever worked a cashier's a, a cash register? And I said, no, but I have 97 in math. That's my attitude. <laughs> um, he said, have you ever worked in retail? I said, absolutely not. He's like, you will not get this job at McDonald's. However, I looked at your materials and you'll do well in life. <laughs> and so it, it, it proceeded from there. Ultimately, I ended up working, getting a summer internship at um, a bank that's now been merged into a, no a number of other banks. Um, where there, you know, I wasn't given very much to do. I remember sort of, you know, having my suit and being ready for the summer internship um, and was excited to sort of put my mind to work. And it was sort of like, you know, kind of paper uh, pushing. I would then meet someone towards the end of a summer internship that said, basically stay the course. Um, and you can do well in banking if, you, if this is a career that you would want to pursue. Ultimately, I went to Swarthmore College. Um, as Dan mentioned, I went to Columbia Law School and was working at, um, at Pfizer um, and I did not get a promotion that I had kind of staked my, my, my journey on, you know, lots of things I put on hold for this promotion and I didn't get it. You know, two people were going to get it and I didn't get it. And at that point I started looking around saying, what about finance? You know, um, that's where I started with these summer internships. <laughs> and ultimately there was an event called careers for lawyers at Goldman Sachs. <laughs> I went to the event, and if any of you had walked into my office that day and said, hey, Asahi, what do you think of XYZ? I would have stopped because it was not an important meeting on my calendar. It was sort of a nice to have. We all do that. If you have some time, you throw it on. The stars aligned, and I looked up. I saw it on my calendar. I said, I can make my way down to Lady Maiden Lane where the event was happening. And I went into this room, and there were all of these amazing people with resumes and business cards who clearly prepped. For, um, for this event. And then there was me. Um, and I had to kind of decide on the spot, are you here to attend or are you here to play? Are you here to try to do this? And in that moment, I said, I'm here for a reason. I'm going to go for it. And so I developed this strategy. I said, I was going to figure out who on the panel I connected with. There were about five people on the panel. I was going to spend time talking to those two people at the cocktail hour, not spread my weight across the entire group. And I was going to try to be to ask the first or second question. And that was kind of the, the ramshackle strategy I came up with in the moment. Um, ultimately did that. And two weeks later, I got a call for an interview at Goldman Sachs. And the rest is history 16 years later. Goodness. Uh, I think that resonates with so many folks here, including myself. Yeah. In terms of thinking, oh. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> including myself experiencing failures, rejections when we don't expect it reminds me of my experience as a teenager trying to get a job at the local restaurant as a busboy. Only the employer did not tell me that I was going to do well in life. <laughs> and so um, your story in many ways. Know. Yeah, well, I have, we'll see. Um, my, my perspective as well is about, you know, how in many ways what you told was the story of your career in terms of 
your professionalization, but many folks here ought to also know that you have a really interesting background living in many different countries. Um, you and your family are immigrants to the US from Guyana, and you yourself have lived in various places, including Japan. Can you, can you talk about the experience of living and growing up and working in different places and how that has affected your careers, your interests, your yeah. personal ambitions? This is of particular interest to me. Sure, I love and, this question because it's had a profound impact on my life and I see it in the work that I'm doing now in terms of having that more um, global perspective, which none of it really was by design. So you're right. I came to America when I was 10, um, my family of seven, um, five kids, my mom and dad, and went to New York City public schools in Brooklyn. Um, and at the time, Japanese was sort of huge and, and the, the Department of Education had seeded funding to about five different high schools across the city for students to study Japanese. And at my high school, nobody signed up. Everyone wanted to take Spanish or French, nobody wanted to take Japanese. And the principal came up with this brilliant strategy <laughs> where he sent letters home to the top students, to our parents and said, give this to your parents. Um, and there my, my mom and dad came to me and they said, the principal has selected you to study Japanese. Um, and I said, really? And, and I was like, oh, this is great. My dad's like, of course, you must do this. Um, was the best thing ever. So there you had this class with like the best students all studying Japanese. Um, and at the end of the class, there was this opportunity to apply for a scholarship through the American Field Service, AFS, to go live in Japan and basically defer college and spend a year between high school and college, um, a gap year, um, uh, at a Japanese high school and living with a Japanese family. Um, now, 30 years later, um, the Ota family is an integral part of my life. They were just here in 2019, um, and we have kept in touch. They've come to America every year since, and I've gone to Japan over 15 times since. I just got photos a couple of weeks ago um, of the whole family at an event that they all went to together, and they wanted me to see the photo. That was an incredible, incredible experience, being out of my element. Um, having to learn and grow and sort of realize that across you know, race, ethnicity, there's so, there, there's so much more unequivocally that I know for sure that we have in common than, than separates us. Fast forward, I would work for Cleary Gottlieb scene in Hamilton and wanted to work abroad again and um, got staffed on a deal in Germany. And they said, would you wanna go for a couple of years? And I thought, Sure, sounds great. I don't speak German, but I can learn. Um, and I'm terrible at most things, but I do have a facility for languages. And so started studying, um, studying German and lived in Germany um, for about a year and a half um, for Cleary. Um, and then obviously came back to the US and pursued my career. But it having had that those key experience, South America, Asia, North America, Europe is all sort of part of um, certainly my narrative and my lens of the world. I think one important thing to emphasize here is that um, for our MBA students here, a lot of the curriculum is, is global pre-pandemic and hopefully post-pandemic, they have a chance to travel abroad to get some of these experiences um, that they otherwise would not have. And I think the point of all this is to inform a worldview, to make us realize that the differences that make different cultures unique and interesting are something that we can also think of as opportunities to see similarity. And, and this experience that you've had is, is highly resonant as well. Um, it's a natural transition to talk about how this informed uh, your thinking about your current role right now at, at Goldman Sachs. Um, was corporate engagement and CSR, corporate social responsibility, something you always knew that you wanted to do? These formative experiences that you had, uh, were they were they what made you uh, uh, attracted to social impact as, as a career? Um, could you talk about a little bit about how those linked up to what, what you're currently doing? You know, I, Dan, I'd love to say mm -hmm. that somehow I, I, um, uh, those experiences is what led me to wanna do the work that I did, um, that I do right now. Um, ultimately, when I started out, I wanted to be able to um, uh, help my parents um, and to create a life for myself that was um, better than the, than the, the uh, from a financial perspective. I always say we were values rich, but materially poor. So I wanted to be able to really create a sort of modicum of, of a kind of life for myself. That was what drove me in the early days. Um, sort of a privilege check, if you will, like 
I, I didn't come from that background. It was something that I knew that I had to um, work hard to be able to attain, to be able to help my parents and my siblings who were coming up behind me. Um, and so once you sort of, you think of Maslow's hierarchy, right? So once you've, you've um, been able to do that, then you kind of look around and say, okay, there's so many years I have in the world. What do I want to do with my talents, my, um, uh, my path, that ultimately I'll be able to say that, you know, one, I grew, two, I had an impact in the world in a way that I could be proud of. Um, and so I worked as a lawyer and compliance officer. I was the global head of investment banking compliance um, at the firm and had worked very closely with what would become, and I could not have ordained this, the CEO, the CFO, and the president of Goldman Sachs. And um, I got a phone call, I was doing my compliance job and I got a phone call from uh, the senior team to say, we would like you to come up to the executive office and um, become president of the foundation and global head of corporate engagement, my current seat. And I have to tell you, if I had gone out across the street with my resume and said, so foundations, I would love to be your president. This is the experience I've had. I don't think anybody would hire me. Um, but knowing the work that I'd done, knowing my background, they understood and they could see something that I really couldn't. Once I got into the seat, I realized that I'm, my path was leading me to this, though I didn't know it. And so the work that I do today is really heart-driven. It's, it's, it's passion-driven but it's also very much related to who we are as a corporation. We are an agent of capital markets. And so how do we use that sort of capital for good is what I spend most of my time thinking about. I wanna get into some of the specific initiatives that you've launched and run at, at Goldman. Um, but before we do that, I'd love to get a high level um, kind of uh, bird's eye view of your impression about how um, in terms of the corporate world, how, whether it's been easier or harder to um, make the case and implement CSR initiatives uh, or ESG initiatives in companies like Goldman. Here at Columbia Business School, it's a required part of a curriculum. And even if it weren't required, I'm fairly confident that every faculty here when teaching a class would have some meaningful part of their class devoted to talking about social issues and social impact. And so certainly our students here are thinking about it in terms of when they graduate and are thinking about developing these initiatives themselves or leading them or creating them. How have you seen things change over the past uh, few years or decade or so? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely become easier, right? Mm -hmm. It's no longer a nice to have. It is a must have and it's central to what you do, right? So the fact that my, my role and, and, and I sit on the management, the 30 person management team of Goldman Sachs sort of says the, the importance of that seat because very often, you can imagine if it's less important, they'd say, well, does that, does that seat of the group of 30, does that seat need to be one in the room? But that seat is one in the room, which I think is a really strong indication of how the leadership thinks about it. And I think, look, we're not unique in that, in that other corporations I think are doing very similar things, but I think it speaks volumes for the importance of that seat. Mm -hmm. So in terms of thinking about going from the high level view to specifics, oh, yeah. um, so you've launched some innovative programs for Goldman. I'd love it if you could maybe talk about one or two of them, but I'm going to mention a few of them. 10,000 small businesses, 10,000 women, 1 million black women, Goldman Sachs gives and community teamworks. Um, they resonate with a number of the different uh, initiatives and projects that we here at the Tamer Center um, are also thinking about as well. And so certainly you have fans uh, among you here, um, but can you share what it's like to represent Goldman's philanthropic initiatives? How does it feel personally? And could you talk about perhaps not all of them, we wanna to get to everyone's questions here as well, but perhaps one or two of them to help us understand what it means operationally and also in terms of um, uh, uh, your role uh, at the company for these sure. initiatives. I love talking about these initiatives, but yeah. I will uh, try to be as, as, as brief as possible. I, I'd say a couple of things. One is I think it's important to understand sort of the arc of it. So we, Goldman Sachs had a foundation at its IPO and we seeded that foundation uh, with several million, a hundred million dollars when we uh, launched the foundation. Then um, about 13 years ago, we launched what was called, what is called 10,000 Women. So this is 
a program that is focused on the development of women entrepreneurs in developing countries. Think of it as sort of big business meets small business. What can we learn from small business? How can we catapult small businesses, knowing that small businesses are the engine of the um, economy? That program now was an educational program. We've added an access to capital piece because what we understood is it's great to educate women entrepreneurs in Nigeria and China and Brazil. And we have over 10,000 entrepreneurs that have been part of the program. But what they need to really um, increase the blast radius of their impact is capital. So can we do that one, two punch? So we partnered with the, um, uh, the World Bank to have a capital facility of education that we provide as well as capital that we're also um, uh, providing to women entrepreneurs in developing countries. So that's 10,000 women. Fast forward a couple of years after that, post-financial crisis, while that program is awesome and we still do it in developing countries, we realized that we needed to do something here at home. And so what could we do there? So there again, we built a, a program called 10,000 Small Businesses. We are, I pinch myself that, that this is what the sort of the embarrassment of, of riches, but Mike Bloomberg and Warren Buffett serve as chairs um, of our advisory council to 10,000 small businesses. They were there at the outset as we built out the program. That program, um, we've now um, been able to touch 12,000 entrepreneurs in the United States, representing all 50 states, Puerto Rico, District of Columbia, similar around educational program, free of charge. Um, and the data is what's critical because you talked about impact and um, the data at the very beginning around comp matters, but what about impact? And we track the impact, of course, of every single dollar and the programs that we have. And so when you look at when our entrepreneurs take that program, where are they six months later? Well, we interview them um, and track them six months later, uh, 12 months later, 18 months later. They increase revenue. They create more jobs. They grow their teams. And so the proof is in the pudding in terms of the actual impact of the programs. Fast forward to March of, of last year, and we wanted to do something um, more as it relates to racial equity. Um, and then we launched a program called One Million Black Women. And that is, plainly speaking, the largest commitment ever in the history of this country specifically focused on Black women. $10 billion, and that's billion with a B, over the course of the next 10 years, uh, to positively impact the lives of at least a million black women. And that's 10 billion of debt and equity balance sheet investment that Goldman Sachs is making across six different uh, pillars. The ones you'd expect, uh, healthcare, closing the digital divide, housing, access to capital for black women entrepreneurs. On top of that, 100 million of philanthropic capital. So. Um, these programs are all a consistent through line that build on each other. And I think one of the key things that we are very focused on is we don't do something that's of the moment or episodic, right? Because how to lose credibility quickly in terms of your impact program is that there's a headline, you dip in, you do it for a year, and then you dip out. And the community says, okay, like, were you really committed to us or not? So each of these programs, 10,000 women, 13 years old, 10,000 small businesses, 10 years old, a million black women, we've announced a 10 year commitment. So it gives you a sense of how do, when you peel it back, how does a corporation really think about it? You know, I cannot tell you how, how much this speaks to me in terms of some of my work as a researcher where I study entrepreneurship and, and inequality specifically. And one of the interesting findings that, that constantly emerges, this is not new, but this is something that researchers of entrepreneurship know time and time again, is that it is one thing to teach folks the fundamentals of entrepreneurship, but really it's access to capital and access to formal institutions that create unequal divides between different demographic groups where they shouldn't appear to begin with. And so everything that, that you're doing and leading kind of addresses this problem head on. It's very much kind of spoken to in the academic literature and so great to see it in practice as well. You've described three amazing programs. Um, I'm wondering as well, in terms of addressing these important issues, um, you touched on a couple of things. So the first is about how you are thinking about impact and how you track uh, the lives of those that these programs touch. And the other aspect is how you select certain issues uh, to be part of 
uh, the philanthropic endeavors of Goldman Sachs. I'd love to kind of dive into the first one before going into the second. I'm also mindful of time. It's about 12.55 right now. Um, if it's okay with everyone, I, I would like to sit here and talk for hours, but I know <laughs> that some why. of you have, have questions as well. And so after maybe about two or three more questions, we can shift it over to our, our audience here. And also those of you who are on Zoom, I have no idea where I'm looking, those of you who are on Zoom, um, to ask questions as well, but but hopefully I'll be able to ask some of these questions. The first question is about impact. You talked about different ways of measuring impact. Uh, this is something that's of um, a particular interest to many of our students and also many researchers and practitioners. How do you know that you're making a difference? Um, on the financial side, this is something that's quantifiable. Can you talk about using examples, different ways of understanding the progress you've made in terms of social impact with some of these programs as well? What metrics do you look to? Are some of them validating? Are some of them have you learned are actually not that useful? How, how would you think about these issues? Yeah, mm -hmm. so I would say probably four things I'd underscore. One is it's important to, to outline your impact measures at the beginning when you're launching your program, right? Because that allows you to be able to collect the kind of data as you go. What's the starting point? What's the business? It's in Chicago, okay, great. It's a coffee shop in Chicago. What, you know, how many, what's your sales? What's your revenue? How many people do you employ? How many facilities do you have? So you wanna make sure that you're building your KPIs or key performance indicators at the very beginning of the program. So one. Two, you've gotta stay nimble as you go throughout because what you'll find and what a lot of people don't say is as they build these programs over time, you learn things as you go. One of the things I'll highlight is when we launched 10,000 small businesses, we didn't really expect the entrepreneurs to do business with each other, right? That wasn't a KPI with these business owners who are all in class together and learning together, do business with each other, right? Um, within two years, what we were finding is 86% of the businesses who were, part of our, who were part of the same cohort were doing business with each other. Um, and so all of a sudden our, our KPIs and our impact tracking said, okay, We've got something here. So yes, develop them at the very beginning, but also stay nimble. And, and that was one that we added over time. What percentage of these businesses are actually doing business with each other? And what kind of revenue are they generating? They've become on their own sort of a mighty cohort. The other thing that I would say is really important to think about is what's the issue you're addressing and how is your program specifically addressing this? And is it sustained over time? So if, if our program is, which it is, educating business owners who want to grow to grow their business. Well, did their employees base grow? Did they open new facilities? What's their revenue? How many of these businesses closed during the pandemic? So Dara from my team will tell you that during the pandemic, one of the things we were doing was calling our business owners. How are you doing? Literally teams of Goldman Sachs employees robo calling to say, how are you doing? What's happening? What are your needs? Um, and making sure that you're the people that you're serving, the businesses that you're serving are not aligned in a spreadsheet, right? That's their livelihood. They started that business. Sometimes it's a family business where the whole family depends on that business, right? They um, dipped into their 401k if they had one to start that business. Um, they borrowed on credit card, which very many business owners do. And so part of that impact metric has to be um, separating the distance between you and that business owner in a very real way. They have my cell phone, they have Dara's cell phone. And so that level of closeness over time, I think is not a part of very many key performance indicators on impact, but ultimately it translates into impact. Because if you know the businesses in a deep way, you're gonna be able to help them and relate to them um, very differently than if you took my class, haven't really connected with you in about a year, can you fill out the spreadsheet on how you're doing, right? Doesn't quite work. And so I would say keeping that proximity over time is one that's you know, overlooked um, and, and an important one that, that I would seriously measure. That is so interesting. Among the number of uh, related initiatives that we have at the Tamer Center, a lot of that resonates with, with how we think of um, involving our students in kind of the local business community as well. Afterwards, we can certainly talk, talk a little bit about the details that uh, there. The second part of thinking about these different initiatives as well um, is there is so much that you at Goldman can do. There's so many resources, but at the same time, these resources are not infinite. And so 
I teach strategy, and one of the key components of understanding strategy is that you have to make choices. You have to make choices and understand the trade-offs of those choices. And so it's an exercise in prioritization. Um, it's something that I think about a lot, not only in business, but also my career and life. I'm wondering from your view and your role in terms of thinking about the many different ways that philanthropy can impact so many different communities and people, what are the ways that you decide what the next big project will be? Is there a systematic way that you think about this? Is it on a case by case basis? Yeah, I love this question because this is, this is probably the hardest part of the job at the very beginning, which is um, you will, I get inbound from so many different causes and organizations. Um, and all of them are, actually I, actually, I don't know if all of them are doing good work. Let's hope that all of them are doing good work. There are probably some that contact me that aren't doing good work, but they're addressing a need in the community. In, in some ideal world, you'd want to be able to say yes to everyone who contacts you, but you're right. You've got to make clear choices. I feel the sense of accountability and responsibility every day for the hundreds of millions of dollars that are under my purview to dispense in a way that's impactful in communities. And the way that I think about it is, Every dollar that I say yes to, to this organization is a dollar that another organization isn't getting. And I've got to make sure that I am disciplined and rigorous and call to ask myself, why does it make sense that I'm giving here and at the level that I'm giving versus giving in another area? Um, and what we do is we think about a, a few things. One is who are we, right? Um, the, the, activities that we're involved in has to make sense for who you are as a corporation. So being a bank, an investment bank, um, and we think about small business, for instance, makes sense. We think about investing in communities, makes sense. So it's that you know one-two punch, as I like to say, between in, in philanthropy and investment. And so one is, does it make sense? Does it align with who we actually are? Two, is it an area where we feel like we can actually make an impact? Three, how are we gonna uh, measure that impact over time? Four, regardless of what, who's in this seat long after I've left Goldman Sachs and long after CEOs or CFOs have changed, is this the kind of activity that um, Goldman Sachs can be involved in over the long term to make impact, right? And again, goes back to that not being episodic which is absolutely critical. So it's not a CEO's pet project. And then once the other person leaves, it's sort of like, okay, we've whiplashed onto another cause that we're, we're somehow involved in. We're stewards of a 150 year old bank, right? And that sense of weight and responsibility that the decisions that we're making have to stand that test of time, I think is something that is personal as a partner and a, and a leader of the firm. And that informs our decision-making. That last component, what you said about this dimension about the longevity of the impact is one that I rarely hear about, but in many ways, I agree with you. It's the hardest one to assess, but probably the most important factor to, to consider as well. Speaking of longevity, your CEO, David Solomon, recently made a decision um, that I think will have longevity in terms of its impact. And that decision is that it will commit Goldman to only investing in companies that have diverse board members. And since this went into effect, this policy in July, 2020, Goldman has expanded that commitment to, to two seats. So the commitment has seen some success in, in companies that, that, that uh, Goldman supports in terms of their IPO process. So can you talk about the importance of this particular commitment? Because this is at the company level yeah. now. This is at the corporate level. Sure. Um, what is it rooted in? And, and how do you see this as having a positive effect, um, uh, not only on organizations, but on society as a whole? That will be my last question before we turn it over to, to students uh, or the audience members here. Yeah, I think that decision that David made was so impactful because you can, you can, you can make moves, uh, and I'm back to Sandra's chart at the beginning on you know, investment, philanthropy, that continuum of different ways of making an impact. We can do a lot in the philanthropy space, but ultimately when companies are making decisions, you wanna talk about, is it related to the core business of what they do? And we IPO companies. And so when our CEO comes out and says, we won't IPO a company, we're willing to turn down business from companies if they don't have at least one diverse board member and it went to two diverse board members in July of this year, it's kind of the ultimate putting your money where your mouth is. 
um, in terms of your level of commitment. What we saw was um, just an incredibly positive uh, feedback. Of course, were there negative feedback from some? Sure, right? Um, you know, is this the place of a corporation? Um, but incredibly positive feedback overwhelmingly, uh, and in particular from our clients. And here's something, speaking of things that I'm not sure we fully anticipated is, Dan, they said, can you help us? Do you know Sandra? Do you know Dan? Can, we, can you help us make our boards more diverse? Mm -hmm. And so now we actually have a, a few people at the firm whose job it is to try to um, find diverse board members to help our companies um, fulfill the requirements to be able to, for us to be able to IPO them. And so that's sort of these wonderful um, uh, sort of uh, evolutions of things that you see over time, um, you know, where that's now become an effort of, of trying to uh, find more women and, and other board members. I see that as also raising the commitment on the part of Goldman Sachs as well. To me, that's incredibly important, not just to have a policy, but also have the means to put it into action. And, and that's something that speaks volumes to me. I think we're ready for some questions from the audience. Um, and so, so we have a few hands here. We have some folks who are gonna come around with mics. They have, they, are, they have great cardio, so they're gonna get to you quickly. So uh, we have three hands at the, at the, at the front here. And, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you so much for your time. This has been really helpful. It was interesting to hear how you mentioned for the developing, like investing in the women in the developing world program, how you first thought that they needed training, but it turned out that they needed capital also. Um, I, before CBS, I used to work with small businesses across Africa with programs like um, Goldman Sachs. And that's something that I saw a lot of the times where donors would come in with an idea of this is what you need, but then that's not actually what the beneficiaries would need. So there was often a gap between. So I'm wondering now when you think about maybe launching new programs, are the beneficiaries involved in informing how the program is designed in terms of what they get out of the program or for existing programs, you mentioned that there's incredible longevity, 10, 20 years. Is there some kind of a feedback loop from the beneficiaries in terms of this is, you know, this program is working well in these aspects, but not so much in these other aspects. And is the, are there programs, um, do they have a level of flexibility in taking those kind of feedback into consideration? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's great that you worked uh, in this area specifically. I would say a couple of things. We started um, A Million Black Women, as I mentioned, was launched a year ago. And we did it in an unusual way to, to very much to your question, which is usually you launch a program, you figured out every aspect of it, you know, for your big launch, what you're going to do. Of course, you've had to get all your internal stakeholders on board. And we did that. But when we went into that meeting, we said, we want to launch a million black women with listening tools. So we're going to go around. Um, Mostly it was a, a number of them were virtual, but uh, we've done now a number of them uh, in person. And we just, we don't wanna tell black women what they need from an investment perspective or philanthropic perspective. We know that very often those closest to the problem are in fact closest to the solution, but no one bothers to ask them. So we're gonna ask, this will be a humble Goldman Sachs. This is gonna be a listening Goldman Sachs. Um, we've done now 50, listening sessions, 20,000 women and girls have tuned into the listening sessions in the last year. And that doesn't even count the, the input to the website where we opened a field on the website where people can give us input. And so Dara and I have spent many, uh, many an hours reading through the feedback that we're getting, what people are saying, and that's informing the strategy. In particular, we made a number of grants literally from organizations that contacted us from the website or from a listening tour to say, I'm doing this great work. And we said, we wanna learn more, followed up and they've received funding from us. That also opens our aperture, right? Because sometimes you can hear from the same organizations. It's sort of like maybe in your classes where maybe the same people raise their hands. I don't really know. I'm sure school has changed very much since <laughs> I was in it. It happens. Um, it happens. Maybe from time to time. <laughs> um, 
And, and here you're hearing from smaller organizations in different spaces that have no in or connection to us whatsoever. This provides an open door. Any more questions? Thank you for sharing. So I think like very interesting to learn like your experience. So I'm thinking about like maybe as your job, like you kind of managing a lot of stakeholder interest. You have the fiduciary duty, but you also have like a think about the beneficiaries. So I want to learn like what do you see as the biggest challenging about like managing multiple like different stakeholders interest? And do you have any guiding principle to like teach us as well? Ooh. Um, I do have very many stakeholders, um, many internally, many externally. I think about our employees as a stakeholder, because one of the programs that, that Dan mentioned was Community Teamworks, where our employees um, volunteer with over um, 900 organizations around the world every year. So very true, multiple stakeholders. I guess I would say some guiding principles. One is transparency, right? We're thinking about launching this program. This is how much it's gonna cost. This is the data that we have around it. This is why we think it makes sense. We wanna make this donation, whether, whatever. So one, I'd say transparency. Two is fierce accountability um, to each of those stakeholders around what we're doing. Three, I'd say is co-creating with stakeholders, right? And again, it's around listening, taking input. Don't like that one. Don't think that makes sense. Put that aside. Oh okay, maybe I need to pivot, right? And so I would say those are probably um, the sort of three ones that I think about at the moment, yeah. Hi, thanks again for, for being here. This is super, super interesting. And my question uh, kind of builds on Professor Wang's last question in which you explained how um, Goldman identified this need of the companies to have like more diverse, teams and you're helping out with that. My question is, have you identified any other needs regarding like the inclusive and the equity part? Like if we focus on the DEI, I think you've got like the diversity part covered. Is there anything like you look forward to in the inclusive and equity uh, side? Yeah. Um, so on the inclusive and equity side, I think the, um, the big uh, input and need is around greater investment right? Because philanthropy is doing its part. So if you think about it, it's sort of like public, civic, investment, philanthropy. So I think it's around finding, um, whether it's private equity or venture capital of other kinds of investment instruments and vehicles to be able to invest in a way that's more equitable. Um, also supporting diverse founders, right? Uh, it's one thing to do it in the community, but what about diverse founders is another sort of key area that we've been focused on as well. We launched an initiative called Launch with Goldman Sachs, a uh, billion dollars uh, committed to investing in um, primarily women owned companies or managers that are female. Um, and we've now expanded that to include sort of a, a Latinx and um, black cohort as well. So I think it, a lot of it is sort of leaning more into using your investment muscle um, for that, um, for that E component of it. Oh, I think we have a question over Hi. here. Let's see. If I'm audible. Hi, I'm Aditya. I'm from India. I worked with the government of India before coming to CBS. So a lot of the ESG sort of, uh, really resonate with me. An emerging narrative is, um, is how, and something I personally sort of, uh, resonate with is that impact investing is trying to solve the problems of what corporate America is or corporate world is in, in fact created and the inability of the governments to solve them. So I think the question is, we do, we do talk about what and how impact needs to be sort of uh, deployed to create more impact, <clears throat> impact funds, but we probably don't speak much about what less of that corporate um, world needs to do. Uh, so we speak about what, how more should we do, but how, we don't speak enough about how less we should do in terms of the way we run businesses, et cetera. Uh, so how does, you know, how do you sort of view this, uh, this argument and what is Goldman Sachs doing in terms of the organization's influences as well as its clients on working on these things on how 
businesses can be run better uh, and not focus on solve solving problems that businesses create themselves yeah look i think that's a that's a that's a critique and a, a fair critique around you know are you or are corporations um, creating problems and then on the back end you know creating programs that are you know addressing the very problems that they somehow uh, that they somehow created you know i would always like to throw it back to um, the individuals who make the critique to say, well, how specifically do you think that we're doing that? Because if that's the case, we then want to look at not doing that uh, because that's not the purpose to create this virtual circle of creating a problem, mopping it up, creating a problem, mopping it up. What's the point? That's not what I want to spend my life doing. Um, and I can say that, you know, speak for, for our leadership at Goldman Sachs, that's not what we want to spend our lives doing as well. So I think I'd start one by saying, what's that specifically that, that they believe is happening? And then how could we potentially, not potentially, how could we change that? The other thing I'd say is, you know, it's, I've seen it play out in communities where, um, that I come from, right? And so for instance, it's expensive to be poor, right? Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you have a minimum value, if you have, you know, only a thousand dollars that you can keep in your bank account, well, guess what? There's like a fee for your minimum balance, right? And you know, there you get less money or, um, you know, I know people that will walk, you know, blocks and blocks and blocks, I did, to avoid a, a transaction fee if you're taking out cash, right? Um, and so those aspects of how corporations, and I think it's fair to challenge us, and we challenge ourselves as we should, to crack open our books and say, um, well, how can we evolve our business practices, policies, and procedures in a way that is, um, that, that reduces the strain um, on individuals um, and creates a, a more equitable world. We do that. I think the move around not IPOing companies is a way of doing that to say, we're gonna be a force for good in terms of moving those changes. We do look through our business practices and think about E, S, and G across of our business practices um, in terms of what we're doing whether it's a stop, start, or continue analysis around those practices, it's happening. Are there, should it be happening more? I presume across all of corporate America, it should be happening more. Um, but it is something that's discussed inside of Goldman Sachs. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you being here and your immigrant story. It really resonates with me. Um, I recently transitioned into sustainable investing in private equity. And one of the conversations that came up with my new boss is, what do you want to focus on? Um, and thanks to Columbia, I realized that there's an opportunity for us to build upon ESG, particularly in the human rights sector. Um, you know, I feel like the negative impacts of human rights are sometimes overlooked because they're done by an investor who invests and therefore commits some form of human rights violation. And I'm curious about what your thoughts are on building upon human rights, particularly invest in investment firms and banks, and how do you see human rights progressing you know, beyond just something that people include in their charter or in their kind of summary of what they follow as an organization? Yeah, and as you think about human rights, what aspect of human rights were you thinking of focusing on? Modern slavery, particularly. I think modern slavery is, in fact, an issue abroad. Um, when we think about how we're investing in places like Singapore, how we're investing in places like Africa, or particularly in my, my part, I'm Colombian, in, in places like Colombia, a lot of like the organizations that we involve in, we're contracting with the executive level, but we have no idea what's really happening on the contractor level. This kind of takes me back to my previous life where um, I was on the front lines and in the trenches of managing risk to the firm and identifying not just whether you should do the deal or not, but what are the, all of the attendant consequences of the deals that you do? What's the risk that those may present to the firm that whatever this P&L is, is not profit and loss, will not be worthwhile to you over the course of time? What I can tell you is each of the transactions that we do go through that kind of analysis. Each of them go to committee, whether it's capital committee, commitments committee, investment committee, um, we call it IC. Each transaction goes through a review like that. 
We have a group called the Business Intelligence Group, which is big. We have a, um, a group called the Financial Crimes Compliance Group. So all of those checks are in place in terms of basically looking at, and Dara's nodding her head because she and I worked in that group together, looking at not only what the transaction will do, forget that. How is it impacting individuals in the world? Does that make sense for us? Uh, and ultimately, is that gonna be something that six months, nine months later, we're gonna regret that we did? And so the control side of the firm is very, very much empowered, though the front line is the business, right? The business is the front line. Don't throw spaghetti against the wall to say, oh, will the control side approve that transaction when you know maybe there's some sort of violation or issue on it. So the first line of defense is the, is the, um, the banker, the trader, whomever. And then the second line of defense is legal, compliance, audit, risk that also look at a transaction and the larger ones go to a committee. So there are layers and layers of review. We have a few more questions. I saw a question here and a question there. I'm not sure who was first, but since you have the mic, it'll be you. <laughs> Hi. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. Um, it's so inspiring to see a woman like you lead ESG in such an important sector. I would love to ask sort of a more personal question on you know, what it's like for you to be a woman in corporate America, a woman of color leading ESG initiatives, what sort of you know, challenges you faced, how you overcame it, and even sort of advice you've given to other companies now looking to invest in, in diversity. Um, yeah, would love to. Yeah, know. well, thanks for your question. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I'd say it hasn't been a straight line. You know, sometimes I remember, in, you know, sort of earlier in my career, um, working with, you know, a particular person. And I, every time I went to the meeting with him, I would go with a junior person and he would make eye contact with the junior person, but wouldn't make eye contact with me. I remember over the course of that meeting, I would move around. I found myself like trying. I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make eye contact with you. Um, I probably looked very odd trying to like move from side to side to see if he would somehow look up. But it's just a funny story to say that I would not be, and I only know genuine and authentic. So I, I will tell you that sometimes you feel discouraged. Sometimes you feel um, uh, that your input isn't as valued as it should be. Sometimes you feel like I just said that, but blank said it, and somehow it's somehow you know more impactful otherwise. But here's what I would say: I am relentless around um, impact and how I spend my time and my effort to further what we're doing at Goldman Sachs. And so those don't really I note it, but it doesn't dissuade me from my drive around the work that I'm doing. Um, and there have been times where I've, you know, called people on it if I needed to, um, either subtly or not so subtly. Um, but I would say, by and large, I would say the issues are less than I encountered when the earlier part of my career. Now, is it because things have gotten better or is it because I'm much more senior than I was then? I'd probably say maybe, maybe it's a combination of both, maybe more towards the latter than the former. Um, but I'm finding more like-minded, you know, leaders. Um, who are pushing forward in this area. And you guys are gonna join the ranks um, or very many of you uh, perhaps already are part of that ranks of like-minded leaders pushing the world in, in, in this direction. And I have two sons, uh, Sebastian who's uh, 12 and Max who's 13. I'm excited for the world that you're all gonna be able to create with greater focus on capital for good, right? Um, and long after I've left Goldman Sachs, I hope that my sort of impact and legacy will be around sort of leading with um, impact first, leading with authenticity, leading with empathy, and ultimately getting results that move an organization that's 150 years old. I think we have time for one more question, if, 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 unless I'm missing somebody. No, okay, thanks. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here at Columbia, and Professor, thank you as well. Um, so my name is Mohammed. I'm in my last semester here at Columbia and actually joining the firm at Financial Institutions Group Yay. with IBD. Um, <laughs> you have to have coffee. Thank you, of course. Uh, so I have a more substantive question. So both of you, you really represent pretty powerful historic institutions. The question first is in the abstract, what as individuals can we do when we're not within the confines of these huge moneyed, you know, historic places um, to push the world in the right direction? And we can use that word right and define it whatever way you'd like to. And second, you know, maybe more practically within GS, within Goldman Sachs, what ways do you as a senior person try to find 
opportunities for junior people, whether they're in the investment bank, whether they're in wealth management, et cetera, to be involved with some of the initiatives you're talking about, 10,000 small businesses, et cetera. You know, how can they contribute in terms of their individual talents and what they bring to the corporations or the institutions they're a part of um, to try to be involved in some of the stuff we're working on. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks for the question. I'm excited that you're joining. I'm sure maybe there are others either on the screen or here that are joining too. So come by, send me an email, stop by. I'd love to connect. So two things. To answer your, um, uh, the second part of your question, we have, we love our employees and we want our employees and even our summers to be involved in these uh, programs. And so if you're a summer at Goldman Sachs, um, you'll be involved um, in our community teamworks program where you volunteer in, in communities, whether it's in a park or tutoring a child or whatever the case may be. And so from day one at the firm, we need um, new employees to understand sort of that culture of service of who we are. Right. And so where do you start that? You start that in the summer and then you go from there. And so we're launching um, our new season of community teamworks and that'll start in April. In terms of the first part of your question, I would say it's the power of one. Right. Is it possible that you can um, get to a level where you can disperse, you know, lots of funding and make investments across lots of different areas? Sure. But making an impact on a single person can be so incredibly powerful. And I can think about you know, the teachers across, the, uh, across my life, um, and probably many of you, um, maybe Dan is that for very many people, or Sandra is that for many uh, individuals as well, who it was a single person who took an interest in you um, that changed the course. And so I would say, pick one. Pick one and start with one. There are so many things that resonated with me about from, from your comments. I just want to mention one in particular, which is your story about how in the early part of your time managing folks at, at Goldman, how you had to shift around the room, hear your very statements be repeated by somebody else and emphasized by others. That same experience has happened to so many people in this room. And so it really resonates. And the reason why that's meaningful to me is because they hear that experience reflected in someone in your position. And I think that is so important for everyone to understand. Even if that hasn't happened to you, at least you have to understand why that's so meaningful to, to many of us sitting here today. Thank you so much, Asahi, for being with us here today. We are so lucky to have you.